joined by Joe Ginetti today for the second episode of Airtime with Gavin. So um, most people know you, Joe, from your time on The Open Fighter and obviously your career trying to get back to UFC. How was your overall experience with being in tough? Uh, it was really cool, man. You know, it was, uh, it kind of made, made me realize what my life needs to be like to succeed in a sport, you know, trying to cut back on all the, the extra BS the fighters deal with and just making my life purely about fighting, you know, wake up, train, eat, sleep, repeat, you know, super simple. And I've tried to make my life as close to that experience as possible ever since. Yeah. So obviously on the finale, you lost this big decision to Mike Trezano. How did you deal with not getting a contract after that? Because even some fighters that lose on the tough finale get contracts. Uh, it was hard, you know. It was it was a lot of um, it was a lot of time of like taking it and having to accept it. And even when I thought I did, uh, I wasn't fully accepting of it. But you know, it's one of those things where nowadays I'm just looking back on it, like you know, you get what you deserve, you get what you work for, and I didn't win, so I didn't deserve the contract. You know, he won. He was the ultimate fighter. He got the contract. So I have no uh, no hard feelings about getting not getting a contract, and I'm on my own path, and I feel like I'm in the right place for a reason. So obviously, when once you went back on the regional scene, you had a difficult run after the finale. How did you deal with the adverse to, like the setbacks, especially since you were so close to being a UFC fighter? Um, same thing. You know, it was one of those things when I was cut from the UFC. I told everybody. I could be right back in contention and get back in the UFC with a couple wins, but what good would it be if I lost two in the UFC and got cut again? So I took the hardest fights I could. I won some, I lost some, I went to a draw once. Um, and like I said, I think it was just the perfect plan. And when it happened, everybody said I was crazy for taking these tough fights. And you look at where I'm at now, and it's all exactly how I thought it would go. Mm -hmm. So another kind of headline that you got was when you took the um, Paddy Pimley fight on short notice that obviously didn't go ahead and you had the weight cuts. Did you kind of look back now and regret taking that decision of going all the way to London for that? Um, I'd say, yeah. I, and I don't want to even say, like, I regret taking... I don't regret taking a fight against Patty because when I took it, it was one of those... They told me nobody else would take the fight on short notice. So I was kind of coming in to save the day. And I did my best and I didn't make the weight, and the fight never happened, and, you know, I got a lot of flack for it, you know, mm -hmm. my name got dragged through the mud, and there's still people that haven't kept updating on my career since who just think of that when they hear my name, um, you know, but I think that'll be another thing that five years from now I'll look back on and be glad I did, because I want to fight Patty Kiblet, and I will fight Patty Kiblet, and I will get my hands on him, and it's not going to be like these other guys who are calling him out for clout, you know, um, Matt Favola just called him out and Patty yeah. replied to the video. Matt, Matt Favola fanboying at the TI over him. You know, it's all clout. It's all money. And don't get me wrong, I'm a prize fighter. I'm doing this for money too. But I want to get my hands on Patty Kimlet for the things that he said and the way that he treated me. And, you know, he just runs his mouth without any repercussions because he's a star boy. But this, this fight never happened at that point in time for a reason. And when it does happen, I'm going to mangle him mm -hmm. for no clout, for no money but just to make a point. So you, you'd happily take that fight in Boston, realistically? I, mm. Realistically, I would I would have a parade if I could get that mm. fight in Boston. But, you know, if I couldn't get that fight in Boston, I'll take any fight in Boston. And then after I win that one, I would love to whoop his ass in Madison Square Garden. Oh, that would be a great fight anyway. So obviously, during the pandemic, you were still on the regional scene. And there was a long time where there was no fights. How did you kind of think? How did you cope with that? And like, think when's the next event even going to happen? Um, it was hard, you know. So I had a fight book for Cage Titans when COVID started, and you know, Cage Titans, I believe, did the right thing and waited until the very last minute to um decide to cancel the event because you know we were at a place where none of us knew what was going on, so they didn't want to be uh, preemptive and and cancel the show and then have the world open back up. So I think it was a week or two weeks before the fight that it got canceled. Um. Which sucked, but like I said, I think it was the right move at the time. And then I kind of just took that time to start focusing on improving. Like, don't focus on training for a specific opponent and focusing on winning one fight. Focus on getting better every day, listening to your body, honing in on those things. 
And, uh, you know, I took two more fights during, like, I don't want to say the end of COVID, but the end of 2020. And I lost two decisions, one much closer decision than the other. But uh, I think those two losses were a big catalyst in the, the changes I made in my training and, and doing all my fight camps moving forward at AK. Mm -hmm. So how would you kind of see training at AK where there's obviously like top contenders all around the gym? How much has that improved your game? Tenfold. Um, I'm the worst guy in the room every single day. And is that is exactly what I need. You know, I need to have goals to strive for. I don't want to be the best guy in the room. You know, if I have a good day and I do better than some of the guys one day, I can be happy with myself. But I know the next day I'll probably go back to being the worst guy in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm always chasing something every day, which forces me to improve, forces me to get better. Um, and that's like just where I'm at in my career right now. Like, I'm just focused on getting better every single day. Yeah, so you were kind of like, you were very young on tough. Do you think not getting a contract at like 22 or 23, looking back, is kind of a positive because a lot of young fighters struggle in the UFC? And as you said, like, there's no point getting into your scene and getting cut straight away. 100%. Like I said, looking back on it, I think it'll be the greatest thing that never happened to me. Um, you know, I've never been super irresponsible with money, but who knows? There's an alternate reality where I win the ultimate fighter, maybe by a flashy KO, mm -hmm. get a $50,000 bonus, and I waste my money. I've seen plenty of people do it in multiple sports, so who knows? And then, you know, like I said, I wasn't fully mature. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have any somewhat man strength. So maybe I won the finale and then I lose two, get cut, and I'm 24 by then or I'm 25 and I haven't improved. And now I'm even worse at 25 than I actually was when I was 25. So, um, you know, like I said, I've been forced to improve by life and by things that have happened in my career. And I think that it's all for the best. Mm -hmm. So obviously about UFC going to Boston, how confident are you? That you will get that call up. Um, I don't like to call it confidence because I feel like being confident that I'll get called. Like I have no, I have no word from anybody that like, oh, you're you're getting the call. You know what I mean? Um, but from a business standpoint, for the UFC, who else are you gonna call? You know what I mean? Um, we don't have many guys that are able to fight on this card from the area. You know, we have uh, Billy Goff, who was the 170 champ of Cage Titan before myself. You know, he could get on the card. We've got Don Shanis at 145, who's in the UFC. He's fought a couple times. He can get on the card. Mm -hmm. But Calvin's not able to fight right now. I don't know what the word is with fun, but he just fought recently. Um, so, like, we're going to need some big draws to not only make this a, a banger pay-per-view card, but to just fill it up with Boston fans and, and mm -hmm. let them know that, like, Boston is here in the UFC, and we're not just, like, a couple local guys on a local card. Like, I want to fight in the garden and make it a point. Like, I'm going to be Boston's next champ. I'm going to be our first champ. I'm going to get the duck boats going through the city. We're going to have the parade, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, like I said, I just think it's a great business move for the UFC to bring me in and make that happen. Um, so, I wouldn't say confident. I would just say, logically, I think I know and a lot of people know that it makes the most sense to bring me in on that card. Yeah, that's definitely a good point because, like, especially for like London, they pick London fighters, but they in America they don't really seem to do that. In like each state, they don't pick people from that state. So, yeah, I and, think like, uh, I th I think that's one thing like America in MMA uh, mm -hmm. lacks. Like, I feel like we don't back our countrymen as much as other countries do. But to downsize it just a little bit, I would have one hundred percent confidence that I would walk out of the T D Garden and the city of Boston would be roaring. <laughs> like I can guarantee I can guarantee the bars and the restaurants in the North End will be packed with people wanting to watch me fight. The garden itself will be packed with people wanting to watch me fight. Whether they want me to win or lose, that place will be roaring. So maybe the entire US won't be having my back, but I know the city of Boston will have my back if I fight at the T D Garden. Mm -hmm. Especially since you're like on top of you're like been ranked number one or like number three in like each place. So, like, you're yeah. kind of, you're past the regional scene at this stage. Like, there is only the UFC now. Yeah, and I mean, that's honestly kind of where my head's at. You know, not in a conceited, like, I'm too good mm -hmm. for the local scene type of way. But um, I don't have any local fights official right now. Um, I don't have an official UFC fight, you know. Um, but I am going to AKA in the next couple of weeks to train and just improve and just get in the best shape of my life and, whether I fight locally next or I fight at UFC Boston, it's going to be the best version of me. So, um, yeah, I'm just going out there to train with the best and become one of the best. Yeah, especially since you had um, a cancelled bout with Luigi Vendramini recently, like, and that kind of shows that you are 
above the regional because you're literally fighting people who are just out of the UFC and not just a regional fighter. Yeah, and that and and that whole entire camp from start mm -hmm. to finish was frustrating. Um, you know, like you said, fighting basically a UFC fighter for local money and on a local circuit, like you know, with obviously less eyes than a UFC fight, yeah. like, that's frustrating. And then to put everything into that camp and to get sick and my body to shut down on me like it did. So after all that, for the fight to not even happen, uh, really sucks. But, you know, it, it is showing that I'll fight anybody, you know. And if the local guys won't fight me, then I'll fight these UFC guys um, in the UFC or outside of the UFC. But, you know, I'm a fighter. I'm here to fight. Every bad fight that I've taken, win or lose, people ask me why I take them because I'm a fighter, you know? Uh, I'm not going to wait around for my opportunities. I'm going to make my opportunities, and I'm going to capitalize on them. So what, what, what will it mean to you if you do get to walk out in Boston as a UFC fighter? That's That would mean everything um, for, as weird as it sounds, not just for me, but for, like, the little kid version of me, you know? Any... Any little boy grows up watching their favorite sports team. You know, I watched the Boston Red Sox. And for a couple of years in my childhood, it was like, I'm going to be a Red Sox player. I'm going to pitch for the Red Sox. I'm going to walk onto the mound at Fenway Park. Or I'm going to be on the Celtics and I'm going to play basketball at the Garden. Um, and, you know, there's plenty, there's plenty of people that think they're going to play soccer for their favorite team one day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this game, there is no team. There is no Red Sox. There's no Celtics for MMA. It's just the Boston fighters against the world. And I can still make that walk at the TD Garden for myself. And I think that the little version of me would be so excited about that. Is there any fighter that you looked up to when you were younger, even from Boston or just in the UFC in general? Um, when I first started getting into the sport, Anderson Silva, um, just his demeanor, his confidence, his style, everything about it, it was just like something out of the matrix, you know, and he got me into the sport and made me such a huge fan and nobody else was doing it like him. And even to this day, he's still mm. actively competing in boxing and, and everything. So, um, yeah. Anderson Silva from the beginning of my fandom to now. What has made you stay committed to reaching the UFC? Seeing as though like a lot of fighters don't even get the second call up. Um, I'm just not good at quitting. Mm -hmm. You know, I played, a, I played a lot of sports growing up. And I wasn't good at a lot of sports growing up, but I never quit. Um, and, you know, a lot of my friends were like, oh, my parents always say, like, I have to finish the season and then I don't have to play next season if I didn't like it. And I wouldn't be surprised if my parents felt the same way, but they never had to tell me that. Like, I just don't like quitting. I hate quitting. And fighting is my, my one thing, you know. I'm not a little kid playing five different sports anymore. I'm just training MMA, following MMA. Um, so this is my thing and I believe I can become one of the best and I'm not going to quit. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think your conditioning, you have an advantage over most fighters that you will fight in the UFC if you could get in because you've had to train for five round fights in cage titans and championship fights? Yeah, 1000%. Well, I think it's funny that, you know, whether it's high level UFC fighters or local mm -hmm. fighters, they always think it's crazy that I fight these five round fights. Because they're like, you're, you're not getting paid money to fight these five-round fights, but why not? Like, it's just more cage experience if it goes five rounds. Like, I'm not worried about my gas tank. I'll fight with anybody on this planet for five rounds. You know, I train with the likes of Usman Nurmagomedov, Habib Nurmagomedov, Islam Makhachev, you know, Daniel Cormier, all these guys, like the kings of cardio. Anybody else, I'll go five rounds with no problem. Is there a fallback plan if you don't get into UFC, like in the worst-case scenario? No. And the beginning of my career, everybody was always like, what's the backup plan? What's the backup plan? You got to have a fallback. got to have a fallback. And I just genuinely couldn't think of one. And I made up answers just to like, yeah, yeah. People were like, oh, I'll do this or I'll do that. And yeah, I don't have one. It's uh, it's kind of like David Goggins said, like, you just got to burn the boats. You know, when, when you don't have any other choice, a majority of people will figure it out. They'll figure out their only choice. And I, that's kind of the position I put myself in. Like, it's fighting. It's fighting for the UFC. It's my dream. And it's what I've dedicated my life to. So that that's that's my one option, and I'm going to pursue it. So, obviously, on Twitter, and obviously in this interview, you keep saying it's the UFC or nothing, essentially. Have you ever, like, thought of PFL or Bellator, even just to still be a professional fighter? Like, or is it just yeah, the UFC? Uh, I've definitely considered it, and I've thought about it. 
and a lot of people ask me this, like, why haven't you done like mm-hmm. a one-off, one-off deal or this or that? Um, my biggest thing that I always tell people is, like I said, I'm not good at quitting, but not just for me. Like I want to have kids one day and I want to be able to look at them and say, decide whenever what your thing is, what your dream is, what you want to pursue and unapologetically pursue it. No matter who it pisses off, no matter who tells you you can't do it. If you want to do it, do the best you can and pursue it, even when it gets hard. And I can't do that if I set a goal to be a UFC champion. And then as soon as it gets hard, you know, my first loss was in the UFC Mm -hmm. and then I get cut. If I, if I have my first loss, then get cut and then jump to another organization. To me, that just seems like, oh, he was doing really good. And then it got hard. So he took a different route. Uh, So to me, it's just like, I decided on my one thing and, and that's my decision. And then there's no change in that. So is there any other sports growing up that you taught? Like obviously you said about the Boston Red Sox, but was there any sport that you genuinely taught you had a chance of getting a career in or was it just MMA? Um, so I only played baseball until I was around 15, but I did think that I was, you know, one day when I played for the Red Sox, um, mm-hmm. I pitched lefty, but I'm, just like my fighting style, I pitch very unorthodox and I throw sidearm, which at 14, 15 years old, I pitch a whole game and then I go home and ice my elbow for four mm-hmm. hours. And so I finally decided, I was like, maybe this just isn't worth it. Um, so I stopped playing that, but that was probably the, my second best sport was baseball. Mm-hmm. So your elbow was sore and you told, no, I'll go do fighting instead. Which yeah, and then now everything's so- <laughs> yeah, now everything's sore. Mm. Was do you have any hobbies outside of MMA, or is it just focused on MMA? Um, my biggest hobby outside of MMA is gaming. I've been a gamer my entire life. Um, you know, even before I was playing sports, I was playing Pokemon and Legend of Zelda and mm-hmm. Mario, and um, I've gamed my entire life. And it's just something that nowadays is just it's a little bit of escapism. It's very easy to have a long, hard week of training and and life, and then turning on your Xbox or your Switch and you're just diving into a story and, and escaping all that and just helping you relax, especially the closer you get to a fight mm-hmm. because it's so hard to not think about the other guy that's been training for eight weeks to kick my ass. So I need something to pull me out of that just for a couple hours. So obviously on your Twitter it says you're a kick TV streamer. Do you think being having that community side of like streaming is going to grow your fan base even like more and have more audience that actually know who you are rather than just oh be uh, the fighter i hope so you know mm-hmm. the, the people that are in skeletor's evil army that you know were watching my twist streams and moved over with me when i moved to kick to stream um they're awesome every single one of them you know and it's like you said they enjoy me for me they don't enjoy just me as a fighter that's kind of just like a side benefit you know they like talking to me in the chat they like seeing the stuff that me and my buddies play you know, they we keep up with, like, real-life events with each other. And they it's a genuine community. Everybody wants what's best for each other. And it's and it's a real friendship of, like, you know, we pick on each other, for, like, in a friendly manner. Like, mm-hmm. we, we have each other's backs. We motivate each other. So having that, and if that grows with more genuine people, amazing. And then, like I said, Saturday nights, they tune in and watch me kick somebody's ass. It's just that. That's just another benefit. Okay. I have one more question. Uh, yeah. After your career is over, how do you want fans to describe your fight style and your career? I want fans to look at my career and know that I never gave up. I gave it my best, and I was always fighting for the finish. Um, and not in a manner of, like, he's running out there and brawling with everybody, but a technical finisher. You know, as a fan, I love watching guys that walk out with their hands down and just step in the pocket and roll. But as a fighter, I feel so much better when I can land 150 punches and you've landed about three and I knock you out or I force you into a sloppy shot and choke you out. Uh, as a fan, I want to see finishes. So as a fighter, I want to I want to produce those finishes and I also want to produce them as flawlessly as possible. OK, Th- thanks again for coming on, Joe. And yeah, hopefully, no, no problem. the next time a lot of people see you will be walking out in Boston for the UFC. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.